OG Rose, and today we're going to be talking about Tractus Anti Academicus by Joshua Hansen, his 2023 publication on modern academia and why we need to critique it and think about it. And frankly, the current uh, college structure needs to be disbanded because it is not serving education. It, in fact, is serving um, private and special interests at the expense of education. We just finished um, a class on Ivan Illich, and, I've, and the great Mr. Hansen uh, mentions Ivan Illich a few times in the book, and I've spoken to him about it. And uh, Ivan Illich warned that modern systems and institutions tended to be disabling. They tended to disable us. They tended to make us reliant on them. But we actually didn't even, we don't really even notice our reliance and dependency because we have access to these systems. Uh, and so we actually think we're enabled. Now, uh, Ivan Illich makes examples of like, you know, the modern stove, cooking. You know, if you can, if you can access, say, Food Lion, then you gradually lose the ability to hunt, uh, to cook food for yourself, you're disabled. But maybe those trade-offs are worth it because the convenience of going to Food Lion is worth being disabled in terms of hunting. So Ivan Illich is not saying that disablement is always bad, but he is bringing to our attention the fact that disablement is a feature of modern life. And it should be noted if we're too disabled to the point where we're not even do, able to do the things that make us human, then in our free time, we're probably just gonna be consumerist. We're not going to be able to engage in leisure as uh, someone like Joseph Piper will talk about. We're probably not going to be very creative. We're probably gonna be susceptible to boredom. And indeed, um, modern society, which you could define by the great enrichment starting in the 18th century as Dietrich Miklowski starts with the Dutch Empire, Holland, etc., so forth, seems to also be the birthplace of boredom. And we can see boredom as a supreme example of disablement. Um, so Illich wants to draw to our attention that disablement is a feature of modern life, sometimes for good, sometimes for bad. But uh, Joshua Hansen makes a very, very, very powerful case that we've been disabled by the modern college system to be disabled from judging quality, genius, intellectual, like inter intellectual capital contribution without the approval of academia. And this is really the key. Um, basically today, if you're not certified, we don't believe you can do. If you don't get the approval of an academic, we don't believe it is true. If your study has not gone through peer review, it loses clout, it doesn't matter. And so basically what has occurred is we are completely disabled for thinking, from our, for thinking for ourselves or making judgment without approval from academia. And this is the problem. Ivan Illich too, in his famous book, De-Schooling, and you know, Ivan Illich makes a big difference between schooling and education. And when he talks about de-schooling society, it's really for the sake of regaining education. I think we can see Mr. Hansen's work in the, in the exact same way, that basically school is now a threat to education. And I know the great, um, the great Hansen and is, is doing a class right now with Paul Virilio and has been. And Paul Virilio warns that in an age of perpetual emergency and speed, that the ability to perceive reality is more and more difficult. And if we can't perceive reality, then we're susceptible to manipulation. Well, all the more reason we need education to be able to maintain a sense of reality, all the more reason why it is dire that we are disabled for, from having a sense of reality in being disabled to be educated, frankly, because we've been disabled by school. It's a great irony that school has disabled us from being educated. But Joshua Hansen makes a very powerful case in his book. And certainly in many of his conversations, I had the pleasure of having a conversation with Joshua Hansen on Julian Benda. Benda is a great example too. He'll reference uh, Thomas Sowell's um, the, on the intellectual class. Uh, he goes through many, many, he goes through, it's, an, it's actually extraordinary how much literature he centralizes and brings together in a single case, in a single text, in a single case to make a powerful, powerful um, diagnosis of the current uh, academic situation and order and to give his um, and to make a case for why it needs to be abolished. I think it's quite powerful. It's certainly, you know, we have a paper where we talk about ending the college monopoly on credentials. Yes, I know that college does not technically have a monopoly, but it practically does. I mean, basically, if you don't have certain certifications, you can't get certain jobs, even if you are more competent in the field. You, basically, the resume has replaced the portfolio. Certification has replaced competence, and that must change. If you indeed are so competent and capable 
after going to an Ivory League, why not compete against the single mom who learned off of YouTube? Surely you will prove to be better than her. But we need competition, and I, comp I am completely on board with the notion that the monopoly of credentials must be removed. And, and frankly, if you at least do that, I think there's a strong... I think Joshua Hansen makes an incredible case, uh, and it's very convincing to me, that you, can, you should just remove the college system in general, because it just does not serve education. I mean, yes, there are some good professors here and there from whom you can get an education. No one is, there has to be, you know, we were saying in the, in the class that a system that is 80% bad is almost worse than a system that's 100% bad because an 80% bad system can be rationalized. 100% bad is like impossible to rationalize. And so, you know, <laughs> that's basically what happens very often with the college system. I mean, and, and so it, schooling has become a threat to education, and I, and I believe in that case, and I believe that a way you could head in that case, either destroying college or forcing it to reform, thus bringing school back in alignment with education, would be a removal of the college monopoly on credentials, where instead of having credentials, you basically return to showing your portfolio, employment testing, things like that. And if the colleges aren't able to um, graduate students who are able to excel on those tests or have the best portfolios, um, well, then they'll either have to be abolished or they'll have to be reformed. And so the introduction of competition to the credential system is so critical. And that's what Ivan Illich supported. And I think Mr. Hansen gives us an incredibly important case for why. He, on page seven, talks about academic rationalism, which defines academia today, can in many ways be characterized by positivism with postmodern features. And I like this because positivism is, you know, evidence-based, empirical, where's your data? But then at the same time, it's postmodern, which questions the possibility of rationality in science. So it's this very weird mixture of you have this hard, like, where's your evidence, while simultaneously suggesting all evidence is corrupted by a particular metaphysical framing of truth, by power. And so you have this weird mixture where basically systems of power are necessary for truth while simultaneously saying that systems of power are bad. And it's almost like because college claims to be against power, their function as power is overlooked. That's why it's so tricky is they'll talk all day about why power is dangerous and we need to overturn institutions that oppress minorities while at the same time being an institution that oppresses minorities. But because they make it transparent and seems to make it their moral doctrine, it's almost like they get away with it because people don't notice because golly, they couldn't possibly be talking about the dangers of institutions and power if they themselves were an institution with power. So they must not be that. There's this, this weird sleight of hand that occurs in academic rationalism that gives them a pass for, uh, th that gives them a pass under the critiques that they purport. Um, and that should, be, that should be acknowledged, and I think Mr. Hansen helps us see that. He further, even further, academic ra to quote from the book, academic rationalism consists in the notion that reliable knowledge is largely only obtainable from someone with credentials conferred by a duly accredited college or university or, uh, or otherwise vote safe through academic progress. Furthermore, that all other conduits of knowledge must be placed under strict scrutiny until they can be properly academicized under its associate, associated protocols and procedures. I think this is a very powerful paragraph, honestly. Well, the sentence, uh, the paragraph, uh, two sentences. Uh, Joshua Hansen is quite the wordsmith, uh, and he puts so many powerful words together. So the sentences are beautiful um, and very, very powerful. I, I, I love reading his writing. And I think this, this really captures a lot right here, is the notion that something is only valid knowledge if it can be put under an academic structure if it can be conferred credentials, otherwise it cannot be considered knowledge. Now, Joshua Hansen is not saying we need no systems of testing knowledge, um, but it's kind of like what I think, I think we can look at someone like our, you know, uh, Kindly Inquisitors by Jonathan Routes that talks about the need for free speech as the test. I think we see online with these liminal web spaces, plenty of tests without credentials and you have to make arguments. So there's no, there's, the idea is that now the only valid test is the credential system, is the academic system. And that's a monopoly on testing. And when you have a, what do you get when you have a monopoly on testing? You tend to get regulatory capture. What happened in 2008 when you had, you know, just uh, the regulators got in bed with the banks, were giving uh, triple, you know, 
very strong ratings on junk junk bonds, basically, junk uh, subprime mortgages. Well, that can be occurring with academia. They have a monopoly on testing, uh, and that's that's very problematic. When we can test ourselves, like you're basically saying that human beings without college are not able to test or judge truth from false. And sir, judging truth from false is really, really hard, but I'm pretty sure that a farmer can probably judge when a tractor is working or not better than some academic somewhere, people with practical knowledge. And that gets into the hype distinction, and, and, and Hansen will talk about those coordination problems and knowledge problems. Um, and and that, that's really a big problem because basically then you have to be conferred to say anything that's truth. Well, that just leads to, to the systems. That just leads to power. Um, that just leads to the only, say, corporations that are allowed to make any judgments are those who have access to PhDs and university research labs. And so it all becomes a giant monopoly. And as much as they talk about thinking, for, you know, we're here to help you think for yourself, that means think for yourself under a carefully, um, a carefully constructed structure of academic credentials. Like you can only think for yourself to the degree that we give you permission. And that's, that's very problematic. But again, in the same way that if colleges talk about power, they somehow avoid the critique of power, Likewise, if they talk about thinking for ourselves, they avoid being seen as controlling how we think. So there's all these sleights of hands that occur. Um, and, and so then he's also going to talk about, Hanson will also say, against academic ra rationalism, I'll be advancing a strict academic realism, which can be defined as the recognition that reality presents the sharpest contrast to academic self-understanding. So modern academia follows an academic rationalism where we need academic realism, which I like, which, you know, that's basically just competition, marketplace of ideas. Um, and it has to be tested against reality. And, you know, that, that does bring to mind Thomas Sowell's notion that an engineer's test is if the bridge stays up, where an academic can have theories that are never tested. It's very dangerous that way. So we need to bring in more realism. We need to bring in more testing. But the market of credentials, the monopoly on credentials, decides what can test it and what can't. And so all tests tend to be fake. They all just tend to support the regime. Um, and he makes the point on page nine that academic theorists are now nearly exclusive authority over meaning in society. So they can tell you what has meaning and what doesn't, what can organize your life and what can't organize your life. And that's a problem. And so Hansen comes, you know, on page 10, he says he's, he wants the total deconstruction of the academic text and the theoretical liquidation of the university. Uh, yeah. I mean, the current system has to change, period. Uh, if we want to, you know, there, there does seem to be differences between some of the research university, the research universities and some of the true teaching universities that are smaller. Um, I don't think Hansen would say that he's against schooling in general, but the current schooling system must be deconstructed. And I also agree that the academic test, text in general is, um, it's, it doesn't tend to advance education very well. It tends to um, advance academia. It tends to advance um, certain agendas. Now, it can be different in the sciences if there's peer review and you know, the, the scientific method. But unfortunately, even the sciences seem to be controlled by interests of corporations and the universities. So that creates a lot of trouble. Um, and so, you know, we can think about academic rationalism as the speculative thesis that academics know what they're talking about and that the academic community and the university system in general operates as a collective force for good in society. So that's kind of what Hansen says on page 13. And that he's questioning that. He's saying that often academics don't know what they talk about and that academic community has not been a good for society, certainly not at this point in history. Um, and, in, and, and because it becomes very self-serving. Um, and also, too, the problem is now it seems like the academic propaganda model and, it, you know, many people feel like there's propaganda coming out of universities with certain ideological bents. You know, it's basically been developed to perfection, promoting hyper-specialized rational ignorance while blaming greater societies for problems initiated by the university system and past generations of academics. So universities cause problems in societies, which you're not allowed to notice unless you're an academic. And then the academic tells you that those problems are due to something else than them. So if college causes a problem, since they're the only ones that can judge reality, when they tell you there's not a problem, then you just have to be quiet and accept it. And, and then they're so specialized, like, well, they're so specialized, they got to know what they're talking about. But the thing that they're specialized in may have nothing to do with the problem you're noticing. And yet, because they're in academia, they get this um, ability to make general assessments and claims that may easily fall outside their specialization. And, and Thomas, Dr. Sowell makes that point as well. Um, 
And so, you know, what Hansen's after is to say is to justify the claim that academic rationalism is false. Um, th that would mean that academia can be rejected as a source of normativity. So what's happened is college has now set what's normal. Like what is the, you know, what, who gets to decide what is a normal society, a functioning society, what we ought to do with our lives? Well, we tend to say the colleges do. But if academic, ra you know, rationalism is false, then that does not follow. Um, and so that's, that's um, a, a big problem. Um, and so ultimately what Hansen wants to argue is that the university is now basically legitimizing the discourse for techno-capital despite postmoderns overall um, being against techno-capitalism. That's kind of the weird thing is that the university claims to be against neoliberalism, techno-capitalism and all these different things, but actually it's a, it's a force greatly in service of it precisely in having this kind of monopoly on credentials. And also you go to college to what? Get a job. Well, where are you getting that job at? Many of the, ta the, 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 the jobs people crave and want tend to be those that support the techno-capital order. And, you know, they get the most money. So all the resources go in that direction. So there's a radical paradox at the heart of the modern university system. And the very fact that it critiques techno-capitalism then makes it hard to think that it actually supports techno-capitalism. Techno and oh, if you see that connection, you're only allowed to see it and make that connection if you are approved of by academics. And so it's all, it's all a self-feeding, self-justifying system. Furthermore, what ends up happening is if universities basically teach postmodernism and indirectly neoliberalism, then you basically lose the grounding for ethics and morality because, you know, God doesn't exist or secularism and all these different things. So then it is difficult to refer to a moral basis outside of the system to, to justify or empower a people against their oppression or techno-capitalism. So here's the problem. All right. So techno like morality, let's say belief in God and God is your highest order, you know, the most important thing in the universe, and you believe in God, then even if the system tells you that the only people who can tell you the truth are academics, you ultimately know that God has the last say. So there's hope of thought and motivation outside of the system. But if you exist in a world now where God is dead, and then the system tells you that you have to be an academic to know what is true, well, then you have to be an academic to know what's true. There's no option except by going through the system. And then if going through the system strengthens neoliberalism and techno-feudalism. You know, you could even say techno-feudalism with that new book that came out on techno-capitalism. Well, the system wins. <laughs> it's, very, it's very difficult then for the system to be overturned because there's no way to find a moral basis outside of it to compel action against it. There's only what the system allows and justifies. And so the system is very powerful. It, you, it's almost practically invincible unless it's just abolished. So that that's how... That's how the eradication of ethics actually helps techno-capitalism. And so when the university destroys ethics, it can talk all day about the dangers of techno-capitalism, but it has destroyed the moral basis that is necessary to oppose it because then the only way to oppose it is how academics tell you to oppose it. And academics are not possible because of how the system is set up to tell you anything that would actually oppose it or actually correct it. So it becomes like... Um, a, a kind of tunnel system where it, it all feeds one another. Um, and then, you know, he makes this lovely point on 44 where he says the likening of the academic to a platonic guard guardianship becomes increasingly untenable as academics generally don't labor, risk little, and rarely confront hardship and yet are given the technocratic reins of society. I think that's very powerful. Like if academics are just living in universities, they're not living like everyday people, then it really doesn't make sense to associate them with like the guardian class in Plato's Republic, which you hear all the time. People make that association all the time. Uh, Hansen does a beautiful job of tearing it down. Uh, he goes through critiquing the peer review process. It's become a reigning epistemology of thought, um, you know, on page 46. Uh, the contradictions of how merit, like you've got this weird thing too, where college basically exists and Ivan Illich says this, and it's pretty powerful, where he's like, look, college basically reflects social class, and it's a way of making people who have wealth feel like they earned wealth. Um, when really it just becomes a class sorting mechanism, the people with wealth tend to keep wealth, but now they can believe that they didn't inherit, that they earned it. So school becomes like merit, becomes a force, a kind of mythos that justifies oppression and control. 
Um, the book gets into that, um, and it will even talk a bit about Sandler's book on that. Um, <laughs> and then also the reason, you know, what's crazy is there's this research that shows that like expert forecasting is only slightly better than chimps throwing darts at a board. Slightly better. So one of the ways that we kind of justify academia is say, oh, well, they, you know, they give us good forecasting and prediction and so on and so forth. They do not. I mean, only not nearly enough to justify all the social pathologies you inherit with the university system. They only slightly, um, slightly improve forecasting capacity, and that gets into Tetlock's work. Um, and and so it, it's like, in another way to kind of look at it, I like how Hansen put this on 140, that the contemporary function of academia is to separate theory from practice in order to advance techno capital. Yeah, because if theory and practice are kind of separate, um, then practice is not able to theorize about its meaning. In theory, that's alternative to the system cannot put itself into practice. And so techno-capitalism is fine. You know, it, it's invincible. Um, so even if you have the university creating theories opposing capitalism or neoliberalism, well, no one puts those into practice. And so it doesn't do anything. But then the very fact that universities critique neoliberalism makes you less likely to notice how it actually supports it. And again, this doesn't all mean that capitalism is necessarily wrong. The giant million dollar question that me and Raymond um, Owen got into is the million dollar question of today is can you have the bourgeoisie virtues, the benefits of the great enrichment that Dietrich Mikowski talks about, the pricing, the, the, court, the solutions and addresses to the pricing mechanism problem, the knowledge problem, the coordination problem, blah, blah, blah. Can you have all that and address thymos and not fall into these mass systems of centralization? That's a million dollar question. And we don't have at this point, you know, there's not a good answer on the table. And the ways to address our social movement right now falls under categories, basically isolationism, something like an exodology of a bard with a Deleuze, something like a Dugan with a fourth political turning, or something like just accelerating techno-capitalism, maybe in a Nick Lance way, or maybe just transhumanism. These seems to be our sociological options right now. And I think we need um, something else. I, we, we certainly need to at least think something else. And I cannot help but think that a massive address, a, a massive piece of the puzzle is indeed ending the college monopoly on credentials and in, in introducing real competition. And that may um, bring about some sort of larger socioeconomic reform. Um, and, and so, you know, as some other things that Hansen will say is uh, the, fa the fact is today's university simply lacks any identifiable purpose consistent with the notion of higher education. And furthermore, increasingly represents an impeccable threat to society, the ecosystem, and the species. Exactly. Uh, very powerful on page four, uh, 141. And he just, he just makes a strong case and will continue to build in his work on why academics don't have access to unqualified pro uh, propositional knowledge. Um, and academia represents an increasingly significant threat to the various societies that Kant thought it was bettering. So he also talks about uh, kind of the attempt to moralize and justify the current system and he critiques that and like basically academia doesn't seem to necessarily benefit the societies that it is supposed to help thus there's no rationally articulatable justification for the existence of the university um uh, it can't be named there is no such a thing um now again how do we legitimize it we say well you go to college to what get a good job we say that now far more than to get an education. We might say to get an education, but you'll notice how in the lexicon, you don't hear that as much. Now, that I can't prove this, but more and more people now subconsciously and instinctually say, you go to college to get a good job. Not to get an education, but to get a good job. Every now and then people say, but more and more we have kind of subconsciously, I think, come to accept the reality that college is mostly a credential machine. It is not an education. And that's... That's really important. Just that shift in our language speaks to everything that Hansen is saying. And if it is about getting a job, then that, that right there shows you it suppo supports techno-capitalism. It supports the neoliberal order. And if the neoliberal order right now has become something like techno-feudalism, this is a problem. Because that doesn't mean that capitalism is evil and we turn to Marxism or something like that. What it means is that we really, really need to what? Think. But what has school kept us from doing? Thinking. And so if we can't think, we can't reform, negate, sublate the current system and something else. And so we seem trapped, like in a Kafka story. It seems, it seems now that rationality has been conditioned in, conditioned in a manner by academic rationalism to be in a Nash equilibrium we cannot get out of. And this is a very dire problem. 
Um, and I think Joshua Hansen's work is helping us see the problem. He's helping us address the problem. He's helping us think the problem. I greatly suggest that you pick up the book. I greatly suggest you support his work. Um, give him a read. Give him a listen. You have a lot. He has a lot to teach and a lot to teach us. And I'm grateful for the work that he has done and what he has put into this book. And you can find it on Amazon. And thank you so much for your time. For more by Joshua Hansen, again, the book is called Tractus Anti-Academicus. You can find it. Again, he's got a class on Paul Virilli with Owen. That is tremendous. Um, I highly suggest that. Uh, and you can, you can find his YouTube channel, Joshua uh, Hyper Theology. Uh, I think his Twitter account is that as well. You'll be able to find it in the description of the video. And thank you so much for your time.